question. What do skydiving, investing in cryptocurrency, and asking out your high school crush to prom all have in common? The answer is that they're all decisions that involve risk. If you want to get anywhere in life, you're going to have to make some big decisions that carry some risk. But how do you process that risk? Is your brain well equipped to deal with it? And how can we use behavioral science to help us mitigate as much risk as possible? Those are the questions we're going to try and answer in today's video, and to help me answer those questions, I've invited Christian Hunt, who is... I'm the founder of a company called Human Risk, and I specialise in the subject that is the name of the company, which is the idea of human decision-making as a risk. And so hopefully by the end of this video, you'll be better equipped to deal with risk. All right, let's get started, shall we? So today we're talking about the psychology of risk. How do you define risk? So look, there are a ton of definitions you can use of risk. I like to keep things really simple because I'm a simple person. And if we're talking about behavioral science, we know that simplifying things is helpful to our understanding. So I just look at it as the possibility of bad things happening. In general, are people good at judging risk? So this is a great question, right? Because it sort of presupposes that there's a yes or no answer. And I think we, we know based from basic evolution, the fact that we're here kind of suggests that we're not bad at managing risk, right? Because there are a ton of things that faced us as a species that if we weren't good at managing risk on some level would have wiped us out. On the other hand, we know plenty of situations where we have all individually screwed things up. And we know that companies who have uh, you know, functions and tons of people and lots of data and lots of capabilities to mitigate risk also screw things up. So there's a lovely narrative as well that says, well, actually, we're terrible at this stuff. And I think the truth probably lies somewhere in between. Okay, let's hit pause right there because I want to explain a little bit more about this evolutionary theory of risk taking through my new segment, Neuroscience Oversimplified. So to try and figure out how our brain processes risk, let's think about some basic concepts of the brain, particularly two different layers. You have your inner layer and your outer layer. And proponents of evolutionary psychology like myself tend to think of the inner layer as being more ancient in terms of our evolutionary timeline. And the reason why we think that is that if you look at animal brains that are lower down on the evolutionary tree than humans, their brains tend to look pretty similar to the inner part of our brains, which suggests, and we have evidence to back this up too, that the inner part of the brain is kind of responsible for all of our more animalistic, primal instincts. And it's really only that outer layer, what some people call the cerebral cortex, that differentiates us as human beings. So the question is, which layer of the brain is responsible for processing risk? Is it the inner layer or the outer layer? Well, it turns out it's the inner layer which means that we're processing risk in our primal, animalistic part of our brain. So what kind of risks are our brains good at calculating? Well, it would be risks to our life, it would be risks to our children's life. However, in modern day-to-day -day life, we don't often face risks to our own life or risks to the life of our loved ones. So what kind of risks are we dealing with today? Well, we risk our health from eating bad food, we risk our company's reputation by not following correct procedures, and of course, we make risky financial decisions. Now, is our brain as well equipped to deal with these kinds of risky decisions that we face in modern life? Not so much. So then, that begs the question, how does behavioral economics help us in mitigating risk? So through your consultancy and through your experience, you try to use behavioral science to improve people's attitudes and behaviors towards risk. Can you give some examples of that? Yeah, so a lot of companies have uh, compliance functions and ethics functions, and that's a, a sort of core part of my work. And those, those functions are there really to make sure the organization is compliant, so, you know, abides by the rules, the laws, and the regulations. That are... And so where does behavioral science kick in with that? Well, the answer is, if you ask most of those companies, they focus on the outcome. So they look and say, we want this organization to be compliant. But where I come in is to say, well, actually, to get that to happen, requires you to get all of the individuals within your organization to do the right thing and not do the wrong thing. And so what I'm looking at doing is saying, okay, in the same way that if I want you to buy my product, or my service, I'm a, in marketing, I will understand what drives that decision making. And I will do things that hopefully will incentivize you to do the thing I want. So I'll run advertisements, I'll make it more attractive, I'll use price, the whole, all those techniques. That toolkit we can deploy within organizations to get people to behave in a particular way. So that's how you can minimize risk using behavioral science in your organizations. Try not to focus on outcomes, but instead try to think what behaviors do you want your staff to be engaging in? What are the good practices that they should be doing? And try and make those behaviors easy, attractive, and rewarding as much as possible. 
But for most of you watching this video, you don't have an organization, you don't have staff you're trying to manage. Instead, you're probably just more interested in knowing, hey Pete, how can I manage risk better in my own day-to-day -day life? Well, that's my next question for Christian. On a personal level, so, so for my audience in their day-to-day -day life, how can they better manage risk? So I think the first, the first thing I would say is recognize it exists, right? So one of the things that we try to do is we try to mitigate away risk. And what one of the things that we know from life is if you don't take any risks, there's no reward there, right? So, so you, could, you can protect your money by not investing in, in funny things, right? But then that, that money is going to decline. You can, you can make yourself safer by not leaving your own home. And yet we know that staying at home is just as dangerous, right? Most accidents happen in the home. So thinking around your behaviors and not concluding that taking action is always uh, you know, more dangerous than not taking action. Did you hear that? Not taking action can be more dangerous than taking action. This reframing exercise of risky decisions, I think is really valuable. If I think back to my own experience of starting this YouTube channel, I could have thought about all the potential risks of putting myself out there on the internet. What if I got trolls? What if I got haters? What if I put out bad videos and people criticized me for them? And let me tell you, all of these things have happened, but in the grand scheme of my overall experience of running this YouTube channel, those things are the most insignificant because what has come as a result of me running this channel over the last year has been the most amazing opportunities. Not only have I been able to grow this amazing community with you of now over 2,000 subscribers of people who are also enthusiastic to learn about this world of behavioral science, but I've also had the amazing opportunity to work with amazing people like Christian Hunt, like Professor Wendy Wood, and even Matt Diavella, and all of these people have reached out to me as a direct consequence of me starting this YouTube channel. And so reframing risky decisions, not just in terms of what might go wrong, but also in terms of what could I potentially be missing out on if I don't do this risky decision, that can really help you weigh up if making this risky decision is a good idea or not. But the other thing that you can do to minimize risk in your day-to-day -day life is to prepare and practice. And look, if you plan ahead for things, you have a greater possibility of getting it right. We all know this rehearse, dress rehearsals for plays, for example, are done for a reason, right? Which is we get used to those particular things. Dress rehearsals are a fantastic example of understanding the importance of practice. And to understand the importance of preparation, I like to think of the concept of mise en place. If you don't know what mise en place is, it's apparently one of the first things that a chef will learn in culinary school. The idea is that before they start cooking, before they apply heat to any of the ingredients, they should prepare as many of the ingredients ahead of time as possible. Chop all of the vegetables, measure every in the correct amounts so that when it comes to the heat of cooking, when it comes to the pressure of service in a restaurant, they're not flustered about having to deal with all of these little ingredients and menial tasks. Instead, they can just focus on the task of cooking and doing it really well. And so you can take this concept of mise en place and what I try to do is basically mise en place any big project in my life. I try and think what are the small menial tasks that I can do ahead of time and I try to do those things ahead of time because when it comes to the heat of the moment and the pressure of the deadline, by having those things done ahead of time, you're able to perform at a much more consistent high level. So that's it for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. Big thank you to my guest, Christian Hunt, for lending me his wisdom and helping me with this video. I'll leave a link to Christian Hunt's company as well as his podcast as the top links in the description. All right, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. <laughs>